Welcome again to the Modern Military History Podcast. My name is Andrew, and I'm here today with another veteran. And we have a World War II, Korea, Vietnam veteran, and uh, his name is Frank Heil. He served in the Army Air Force, the Air Force, the Air Force Reserve, the Army National Guard. In World War II, he was bomber pilot. In Korea, he was a troop carrier. He's flown search and rescue missions and was a survival instructor. He's authored several books, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with him today. Did I miss anything out, sir? Because you have an incredible pedigree. Mm, well, I flew uh, medevacs during World War or during uh, uh, Korea. Okay. <laughs> and he flew medevacs during Korea. Yeah. We're going to add another feather in there because yeah. this is an impressive resume yeah. and I want to make sure I don't yeah. miss anything out. Sir, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for your time. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do is I want to move uh, for the podcast. I want to move chronologically. So I want to start at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And I mean the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And I, we're going to get into your survival instructor days because this is incredible but what i want to start with is where were you born sir where what where were you born zillow washington in what year 1923 okay so uh do you remember um growing up oh yes in that time do you remember when the great depression hit what was that like? you bet i do at the dinner table that was the, the discussion if you lived on a farm during the discussion, and uh, see, I would have been about six, seven years old at that time, uh-huh. eight, nine. If you lived on a farm, you did quite well, and you supported the people in the city yeah. that didn't have the capabilities of gardening or farming. I remember it very well. I had uh, one pair of shoes and two pair of overalls. <laughs> and, and your family was uh, working a farm? Yes, up a in small Washington? farm, but my father was a okay. warehouse foreman at I that see. time in Zillow, Washington. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he had about six guys that worked for him, and so he'd bring them out to the farm, and they'd work on after work, and they would also work on Saturdays or Sundays. And they had produce and animals, of course, uh, during the Depression. What was it like um, for your family during the Depression? I mean, it's for people my age, yeah. the Depression is something you read about in the history books. Yeah. But as a, as a kid, yeah. living it, what are some memories that were poignant to you? Well, you walked to school. We didn't have a bus. I walked a mile each way, I mean, to go to school and to come home. Mm-hmm. And uh, you didn't throw anything away. You saved everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, old, uh, you couldn't get tires for your car. Uh, you'd buy old tires uh, for 50 cents or 25 cents a piece and cut all the tread off and cut the bead out and put that inside of an existing tire. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <It's> rough riding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's... But uh, you were uh, limited to uh, uh, doctors and defense uh, employees or war effort employees. Uh, got, I think, 10 gallons of gas a month or a week. It must have been a week. We got five gallons. My dad got five gallons a week, I think, wow. of gas. You had a ration so, card. Sugar was rationed. And this is during Short the Depression? Shortening was rationed. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. This was uh, 1930, 35, 36. Well, clear up until December the 7th of 1940. One, I guess the war started, didn't it? That's correct. Yeah, you, everything was, most everything was rationed at that Let's time. Let's see, how old were you when December 7th happened? Uh, 17, I think. And what was that like? Uh, unbelievable. Do you remember where you were yes. when you heard I'd the news? Yes, i deer hunting and came home from deer hunting and we stopped at a service station to get gas, a Model A Ford. <laughs> oh, I love those. Th- oh, I love those cars. And they said, uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And I said, will they kill her? because i knew about the japanese from the newspaper there were meetings and conferences yes and uh okamura was the japanese uh, envoy to washington dc and they were trying to settle things but uh, pearl harbor i'd never heard of before so i thought it was a woman that they attacked (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I found out soon enough yeah. <laughs> that it was in Hawaii, but I didn't even know where Hawaii was at that time. What was the nation, if you could like describe the energy 
of the nation after Pearl Harbor. Oh, what was that like? Uh, immediately get ready. I mean, uh, my dad uh, got out his shotgun. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he got out the shotgun. <laughs> and wow. we had people in Oregon here and Washington on the coast uh, just pick up a rifle or pick up your firearm and get on the coast, get ready for the Japanese invasion uh, after Pearl Harbor. Oh, my of course, gosh. Because we knew the Japanese were coming. There was no doubt about that, mm -hmm. no question about that. They won't stop. Uh, because we got all the bad news, you know, from Hawaii, the number of people killed and the mm. number of people injured and the, uh, the destruction of all of our aircraft were bombed and destroyed. It was unbelievable. Now, my father had served in World War I, uh, I think the following Monday. It happened on a Sunday, remember. <laughs> I do. I, well, I know from the history books. Yeah. I remember and, from the history yeah, books. And uh, so he was on his way to Portland. White Salmon Washington uh, yeah. at that time, and uh, uh, he was on his way to uh, uh, Portland to join the Navy, which he did. Wow, World uh, War One vet. What yeah. did he do in the First World War? Uh, he was an uh, artilleryman. Uh, wow. He went to France, and yeah. Well, he was an American Legion commander, elected, mm -hmm. I think, twice at home. And wow. As one, my mother said, he's so patriotic, he's <laughs> pathetic, whatever that meant at the time. <laughs> I, I was an only child, and okay. so he took off uh, about two or three months after yeah. he enlisted. They had to have room for him, I guess. And then I immediately, you know, I was now 17, I think, and I uh, wanted to... Uh, Leave. I never thought about my mother being alone or anything like that. I mean, I'm sure. going to win the war immediately. Sure. You know, all of us kids and seniors were going to go to war, and uh, so uh, I had an uncle that said, "Wait a minute." He says, "Your dad left home, and he says your mother needs you at home until you're 18, at least." Well, the minute I was 18, my mother went back to being a telephone operator. Uh, she's by herself now, and uh, so I immediately applied for the Navy because my uncle had been a Navy pilot, and I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted and this to fly is aircraft. In, this is in '42. This yes, in it's, April. So 42. in '42, you turned 18. Yeah. And you went to the Navy recruiting office. Yes. Wow. And uh, flunked the physical. Oh really? What'd oh. they get you on? Yeah, he said I had rickets and flat feet. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I said to the Navy flight sergeant, what do I do, what do I do? He says, go across the street. The Army will take anything. <laughs> and Sounds I like go, the Navy. <laughs> Sounds like, I told you about these Navy guys I've met. Yeah. And they're like, Navy, Navy, Navy. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like something the Navy would say. Yeah. I, well, I told the uh, Army uh, recruiter at that time, I said, you know, I, 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 uh, he said, well, we get a lot of you guys who come from over across the street. <laughs> he, he says... He says, I'll tell you a secret. He says, you don't meet many girlfriends on the ocean. <laughs> and I said, hey, I enjoyed, <laughs> enjoyed the Army Air Force. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so uh, I immediately applied for pilot training. Now, I had been taking uh, flying lessons on my own. Really? Yes. Really? $4.75 an hour. I'd, <laughs> I'd learned. To... That's quite a bit of money back then, especially yes, when I you were Yes, I was making kid. 35 cents an hour at mm -hmm. that time, working as a stock boy in a, a grocery store. Okay. One grocery store in our town. So what were you flying, or what were you learning uh, flying? It was a Piper Cub. Okay. Yeah, everybody, that was the big aircraft at that time. I think I had 10 hours in. Cool. So I, you know, didn't get airsick, and I could land oh. the Piper Cub almost. Yeah. I want to learn to fly so bad. Oh, do it. Do I want to learn to fly so bad. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, so, so it was you, off the pilot training. You had some experience under your belt. How hard was it to get into the uh, pilot program? Different aircraft entirely. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, it was a PT-17 Stearman, mm -hmm. and I just had a ride in one two weeks ago. Really? Yeah, fabric covered and open cockpit, helmet and goggles. And uh, so then after I graduated from pilot training, I was assigned to a uh, bomb group and... Uh, Flew uh, sub patrols and uh, we were known as sub busters. And where were you based out of? Uh, I flew off the coast of uh, USA, I mean, uh, but I was uh, on my way to uh, Okinawa when and flew a, a couple of missions out of Okinawa. But okay. the war is over. I mean, so you were stateside uh, most of the war from '42 yeah. all the way through '45. Yeah, yeah. And you guys were 
were you based out of uh, Washington or California or here in Oregon? Uh, well, flew out of, uh, let's see, Cochrane Field, Alabama. and. Uh, oh, I see. You're East Coast. Southeast Coast. Yeah, Southeast. Yeah. And what were you flying B- on these sub B-25s sub-busters? at that time. Were they the ones with, uh, you know, when I was a, when I was a kid, when I, well, I'm still very young, but mm-hmm. when I was a little kid and I'd get allowance, I'd get, you know, $5 a week and I'd save it up and I'd buy a different book on a different airplane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know from these books I still have that the B-25 Mitchell, they had ones um, with the clear nose, with the Norden mod- bomb sight in models, it. Six models of it. And then I know there were ones they just fit as many 50 calibers in as they could. We had more more 50 calibers in the B-17. Now and It was the only bomber that I'm aware of, the only medium bomber I'm aware of where the pilot actually can fire four machine guns. Was this your your model that you yeah. flew? It had forward facing yeah. machine guns. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you guys and I flew were the gonna... H model a few times. It wow. had a seventy five millimeter cannon in it. Now those, I read that those the recoil from the the howitzer that you they put in those. It. You could feel it. It started to cause problems with the airframe. Uh, is that I heard is that, that correct? I never you... saw it happen. I mean, I, I heard sure. it was happening, but I yeah. So was it like a short window of time that you flew you could that just model? Feel the jolt. So you were shooting off. Were you in control of the seventy-five yes, as the pilot? Yeah, the pilot was. Uh, yeah, the gunner. How yeah. fun was that? Yeah, it was enjoyable. <laughs> so, do you see? Is it like a big tracer round? How do you? How do you, you mark? Couldn't see it. I mean, I couldn't see it. No, okay. The nose stuck out there too far. And you, I and see. You flew very. The lower you could get, uh, the better off you were. I see. Because uh, ships at sea and submarines, you know, they had guns too. And so they like to shoot up in the ele- elevated. You mm-hmm. know. It was hard to get a moving target right above the water heading right for you. It's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Because you think, you know, the higher up you're going to get, the safer you are. Well, that just means they have you're more. Bigger. They have more. Bigger target. Yeah. yeah, they can get on you easier yeah. because and they can track see you easier. Yeah, right. Track you easier. Yeah. So explain the sub busting method the tact or like the training that you yeah, had say yeah. you're going to see a well, submarine we were in the early days of just de- helping develop it i think because yeah because I, I, I remembered uh, i'll tell you about one quick mission you don't have to record this one but uh <laughs> no i wanted this is cool <laughs> we uh the navigator set up in a nose and uh, uh this was not with the the model with the the 75 millimeter right, yeah. this was a glass in and they added a gunner up front and a navigator up front the navigator usually became the gunner, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, I think we had something like t- eight guns we could fire, mm-hmm. and uh, so we were on, we'd take off at daylight uh, or before daylight, and we'd fly uh, due east, and as the sun came up, then we would turn and make a hundred and eighty degree turn and head back toward the shore, and then we could pick up the submarines that had to surface to recharge their batteries. So we were told. And you could see them on the horizon, and uh, you'd get down just as low as you dared over the water. And uh, on, I think it was about my third mission that I flew, the navigator screamed out over the interphone or in the inter- intercom, sub! All of us looked forward, you know, and yeah, there we saw it. I immediately opened up on it with all the guns we had. Uh, I, well, I could shoot four guns, and the top turret gunner could shoot a gun. Yeah. And it, Navigator could shoot a gun, so we did give it everything we had. And uh, as we, uh, you know, you didn't turn around and come fly back over it (laughs) because they have a gun, they can shoot you. So you fly out at this time, they were developing the program and the system. And they you'd fly out so many minutes, I think it was a minute or a minute and a half. The navigator would tell you everything to turns to make, and you'd make a big square and come back over it and fly alongside of it and look off. And so the navigator had flew us right along the side of the damage done. And he, he says, I don't think we got a sub. He says, there's a lot of floating lumber out there. <laughs> and <laughs> banana crate. <laughs> oh, really? That's he, that's, the <laughs> navigator says, you shot a banana crate. <laughs> so there's some just floating debris yeah. that looks like yeah. a conning tower. Yeah. You had good marksmanship, though. So, Oh, yeah, we destroyed it. So got on the ground, you know, now you have to have a mission report. Mm-hmm. You have to have write it up. And so 
you know, because you expended that ammunition and those ordnance are gone, you mm -hmm. know, you have to tell. So uh, our aircraft went into the inspection. I didn't fly for, for the next four or five days. And went out and looked at our aircraft, you know, and <clears throat> most of the aircraft after a mission, you'd write a bomb on the mm -hmm. side or paint a bomb on the side or, or a, a target, anyway, indicator. And we had a banana crate painted <laughs> on the side of our aircraft. <laughs> Did your aircraft have a name? <laughs> yeah, banana crate. Yeah, that's what, what I was thinking. They called the crate. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my uh, mission. Sure. Yeah, that's the only one I recorded in all my right. mind. That is here. so cool. Yeah. So you're all through World War Two. I mean, that's a pretty serious job because early in the war, if I remember, the Germans would come right up to the East Coast. They were out and, there. Yeah, and I torpedo. saw. I saw evidence of ships burning. At really? Sea. Yeah, you can see the smoke and. But not, yeah, uh, two or three times I saw her. I presumed it was our ships. They were torpedoing. They had subs out there. I never actually saw a sub that I know of. Uh, saw one. But we we. Uh, I was right at well. I think we had so many pilots at that time, but stacked up. Uh, we were flying missions or uh, regular missions, but we had people waiting to fly a mission. I had two or three other people waiting for my airplane to go at that time. What was your impression of the B-25? It was, I proved that a uh, moron could fly it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good aircraft, I assume. Uh, it was one of the first with a nose wheel uh, steering capability. Uh, it was a very dependable aircraft, uh, easy to land, easy to take off. That it, uh, it was my favorite of the six aircraft I flew. Really, during uh, my military career, the B twenty five was my first love. Uh, you know, I flew with a five man crew. Uh, you had a navigator. You had a, a radio operator. You had gunners. Uh, you became very close to that crew. They were like your brothers. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, the C-46 was a great aircraft, but it was a hard aircraft to land. Oh, really? You should have been six foot tall, and I'm only 5'10 at that time. Uh, I had to put a, a parachute seat, parachute, uh, I called them butt packs at that time, yeah, yeah. under me plus a cushion. Uh, it took two people sometimes to land that aircraft. C-46 really? had such a big vertical uh, empennage on it, the, uh, or the rudder on it. Uh, it ground looped like nobody's business. You couldn't hardly ground loop a B-25. What does that mean? Uh, land and spin it. It goes into, you know, oh, really? lose control, in other words. I see. So you, you're landing, you hit the ground, and the thing it wants to like do like you got a, a two drift wheels on hitting you. The ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the tail drops down. Uh -huh. And about that time is when you could go into a. It's landing like this, and you we crosswind catch in and make a circle. Wow. You'd usually uh, hit tear off a wing tip or damage. Because the okay, so because the for me it looks kind of you know pardon my layman's terms, but it looks kind of like a shark fin at the very end of the tail yes. or the very yeah. end of the aircraft, yep. the tail. Yep. And it has a big rudder on it, yep. but it was there was so much surface area on the C forty six that anything could really catch it yep. and spin you out while yep. you still have forward momentum. B twenty five had land the, itself had like the dual um, rudders and dual uh, rudders em, tail empennage right vertical. So those are called empennage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, See now I'm I'm see now I'm learning. You're learning, <laughs> and hopefully other people can learn too. Yeah, the B twenty five was easy to get into, uh, easy to get out of. A good aircraft to bail out of. C forty six was difficult to bail out of. Uh, a lot of guys didn't get out of that, but uh, flying the hump with it in China. And B twenty five, well, do little. Yes, I had the honor of shaking his hand along with two other people or two hundred other people at a reunion. But he picked that aircraft out of all the other aircraft in the inventory to fly off of the Hornet. Yes. Couldn't land it on a Hornet. Now, a Navy pilot did land one on the Hornet, but uh, an Air Force pilot or an Army Air Force pilot never did. Uh, he landed it. Uh, the Doolittle Raid. Um, now, when you joined up, had gone through flight school, you know, just kind of curious. I know that 
you know, from what I've heard, the do a little raid was to serve as a morale booster back in the States, yes. even if they didn't hit that much in Japan. Uh, they planned on doing a lot of damage. Yeah. Uh, they did very little damage. Okay. But it sure boosted the morale. Did you hear what was... I was going through flight school at that time, just finishing the B-25 training called uh, OTU, Overseas Training Unit, I think they called that. Wow. And I was just finishing my uh, flight uh, training, and I knew I'd had the right aircraft. <laughs> yeah. Now, everybody wanted to fly fighters, you know. Yeah. I got to fly a fighter. Uh, my instructor, who was a... Uh, twin-engine B-25 pilot in Italy, and he had been shot down mm. in Italy and came home and volunteered now to become an instructor. And, in fact, he couldn't get a better man. I mean, he'd been through the course, all of it. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I told him uh, when I was assigned to B-25s uh, and being interviewed, which aircraft do you want to fly? And... and uh, uh, my instructor, golly, he was a wonderful guy. He said, yeah, he says, the B-25 is the best airplane you'll ever fly. And he says, it's got two engines. I said, yes. He, he says, if you lose one engine, you got another one. He says, that'll get you to the scene of the crash. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to fly B-25s. <laughs> Did you ever have any kind of issues when you're flying B-25s or Never. any aircraft for that, Never. that matter? Never. Wow. Never, Never lost an engine. Uh, never had an emergency in flight. Now, I only got around uh, 160, uh, just under 200 hours in it. Uh, that was even flying it. I flew it after the war. I tried to stay in after the war. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in fact, you know, everybody's getting uh, out and uh, being interviewed by uh, the personnel officer and uh, giving you a ticket to either on a bus or a train to go home. And... Um, of course, they give you your discharge, and so I said to the personnel officer, I said, uh, um, I'd, I'd like to stay in. What's the first thing you do to stay in? Yeah. He said, you see a psychiatrist. He said, uh, <laughs> I, I said, okay. Well, and I remember I said I'd been earning 35 cents an hour as a stock boy. I now was getting $250 a month. Think of that. That was phenomenal right. at that time. A lot, right. a lot of money. Plus, I was doing something I loved to do. Yeah. I didn't consider it work. That's I considered cool. every flight a joyride for me. So I was one of the few that stayed in until late 46. <clears throat> then uh, they interviewed again. I was trying for a regular commission. And a uh, personnel officer at that time said, if you want to fly, uh, you want to stay in the regular commission, he says, you got to have four years of college. He said, pilots are a dime a dozen. Okay. I'd gone to the airlines and tried to get a job there, and he says, well, you're number 88 today that <laughs> signed up. <laughs> you know, they're all over the place. Wow. And uh, so uh, wow. I was t trying to stay, and he says, you got to go to college. He says, you got to have a degree, and especially other than um, flying. He says, you, you got to be do something besides fly. He says, we got a lot of these people that just fly. What was your rank when you got out of the military in 46? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel when I was discharged, okay. when I retired. Okay, in 46 uh, when you were at yeah, this period? Yeah, I got period. out then as a lieutenant. Okay, so you were uh, well, a lieutenant. Well, got out. I got out and stayed in the reserve mm -hmm. four years. I actually had to go three years because I had a lot of military science behind me. I had uh, uh, U.S. history, uh, War history. I had English, co military correspondence. I had an English class out of the way. I okay. had physical training out of the way. So I started uh, college as a with credits as a second year sophomore. Wow. Or junior? No, no, sophomore. Started cool. With sophomore. Yeah. So I got my degree and went right back on uh, active duty. I got got my degree. Uh, went back and uh, got married mm. and got a letter from the president said greetings uh, off to Korea so those three things happened and I told my wife before uh, I asked her to marry me and she said well yes I'd love to do that and I said good but I said I want to warn you uh, I'm in the reserve and the Korean War is now blossoming and I will undoubtedly be recalled to go to because I have a reserve commission, and I will be recalled to go to Korea. What was it like watching um, 
a kind of a similar question as to when I asked you about December 7th. When the Korean War was spinning up, yeah. what, would you, what would you say um, the energy of the American public was like at uh, that time? People like in my shoes were, we got a job to do. Yeah. We're in the military. Yeah. Uh, just like going to work. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, you were all for going to war and uh, getting it over with as quickly as possible. Yeah. 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 And uh, so my wife agreed, and uh, we were married for almost 60 years. She followed me around the country. <laughs> yeah. When did you go? Um, I assume you had to leave the country at some point uh, for Korea. Um, uh, I stayed. Uh, after the Korean incident, we mm, call it, I see. Uh, never I a see. war really. Uh, they told me at that time you can either go home, uh, and or if you want to uh, now they're wanting people out again. You know the war is over in Korea. So yeah. over. And uh, while well, I had my degree, and now I am a uh, instructor, a flight mm. instructor. I had that. I was an instrument flight instructor. Mm. You know the blind flying story and all that. Uh, I had a degree in education. Uh, how I got that was going back. Uh, I said to my personnel officer, uh, what courses should I take or what? He says, well, you can go into food services, be a food service officer. I said, I can't even boil water. Uh, well, you can be a, uh, uh, he had another one, a personnel officer. I said, no. And he says, uh, yeah, finance. I said, no, I can't even... <laughs> we could checkbook, and he says, "Well, uh, you're a flight instructor." He says, "How about uh, you know, uh, military instructor?" You know, he says, "We need flying safety officer instructors. We need uh, survival instructors." I said, that's it for me. So, did you uh, did you deploy during the Korean War at all? Did you deploy to Korea, or did you stay? I safe? flew stay all stateside. In, in Korea. I flew the 101st Airborne and uh, flew the people out of Chosin. Reservoir and wow, uh, you were part of the chosen evacuation. Uh, yeah, we now ours were all frostbite and just flying out of Korea to Japan. Wow, yeah. So, what was when did you first go to Korea? When were you when were you first deployed? Uh, I've forgotten the date, but it was about I'd say six months after that started, okay. Okay. roughly. What was your impression of the country? God, no man should be here. <laughs> yeah, all mountainous terrain. Yeah. yeah, very mountainous terrain. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember too much about it. it, it I was there for over a, a year, but I don't remember. And then uh, I was based in Japan, flying to Japan I see. into Korea mostly. So you said you, you dropped. You were At this yeah. time, you were a troop carrier? Yep, yep. And um, there were, you know... I've read a little bit about the parachute operations, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm a I'm really fascinated with um, uh, parachute operations, um, and especially the ones that don't get a lot of a lot of coverage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would love to dig into um, what you remember about um, were, were this about your time as a troop carrier uh, pilot mm -hmm. working with airborne guys. Yep. Um, for the people who are going to be listening. Um, the, I want to just briefly explain and let me know if I get this right. Um, paratroopers need to get somewhere to be able to do their parachuting. And the guys who fly them there are specially trained with, with aircraft that are outfitted to do it. Yes. And they're called troop carriers. Right. And um, you, was this, what kind of aircraft? What, C-46, Curtis so, Commando. Okay. Yeah. The C-46. Yeah. The one with the big tail and panade yeah, that could yeah. spin you out when landing. It looked like an overgrown DC-3 or yeah. C-47. Yeah, but it had doors on both sides yes. for guys to exit out. Some of them did, not all of them. Some really? Of them. Yeah. Okay. They were modified, if I remember right, for doors on both sides so you could get the troops out quicker. Yeah. yeah. They just all had to stand up, hook up, and go. Yeah. yeah. I know in um, <clears throat> most of World War II, it was the C-47. The DC three oh, yeah. Dakota, yeah, the C and that six hadn't arrived yet. And the C forty six showed up um, at least, I think, in World War two later in the war. And the last parachute jump over the Rhine, Operation Varsity, had the C forty six. Yeah, and they didn't have enough of them to do the whole thing, yeah. so there were still C forty seven mixed in. Yeah. yeah, but so you're flying that aircraft. Um, so did you did you do combat drops? 
Uh, one might think we did. I, <laughs> now, mostly it was in training. Okay, so you're I training flew. with these guys. Yeah. Uh, but we flew several missions in to Korea where we dropped them on the beach. This was a combat. They were a combat operation. Wow. Uh, there was no great war going on on the ground at that time. We just dropped the troops and sure. that's all we had to do. The navigator... Sure. Go to this when point. we got there, and the load master or the jump, ma jump masters gave the signal, and uh, the mm -hmm. navigator did to the jump master, and they bailed out. And I hope they all got home. That's the last you heard of it, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm I'm curious. Um, was there any kind of pathfinder stuff going oh, yeah, on yeah, at yeah, this had time? Radio and... contact with people on the ground. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the so the navigator handled most of that. Was it your navigator who was homing in on the pathfinders, or was it the the uh, flight leader who was homing in on, or did you all have? Ours was, that time was a uh, single ship. Okay. One aircraft. So it was just you bringing them in. Wow. So you guys were I think these cool. were people that were, I don't know, we were not told what they were doing. Now, this was if you were shot down mm -hmm. uh, or forced landing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't divulge what you don't know. Sure. I made one trip where we took guys in in civilian clothes and they bailed out. That, all wow. I know is I met in operations and uh, two uh, gentlemen in civilian clothes. They were Chinese. I've got a picture of them someplace. Really? Uh, which I was told later we shouldn't have taken. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. You know... Um, two guys were bailed out and that, that hmm. was the, I, I hope they got home. They had a job to do somehow. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what other kind of, um, were you troop carrier the entire duration of Korea? Is that what your assignment was? Or did you fly other I kinds of aircraft? I only flew the C-46 Curtis Commando in Korea and in Japan. Yeah, that was the only one I flew there. Where in I Japan? got to liking that aircraft after a while. Oh, really? Yeah. I, okay. uh There were so many of them got busted up. I mean, and uh, little guys had a, and I'm a little guy. Uh, five foot eight. Well, I'm five foot seven now. I've lost three or four inches. I'm five eight too. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be as tall as you, <laughs> but uh, I could just barely reach the rudder pedals. Oh, okay. And I've had uh, call for the co-pilot sometimes to give me right rudder, give me right rudder. <laughs> Both of us on it at the same time. <laughs> uh, that was a big man's aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. Now the B twenty five. But I felt right at home on that. And uh, the SA-16, I felt uh, good about the picture over there on the wall. First landing I made with that one in, in, the, on the, in the hallway oh, there. Oh, I see. I'll take a look at it. Later. Yeah, when you go out. Oh, that was cool. You got some um, great aviation art over there. Yeah, when you, the first landing I made in the Albatross <clears throat> with an instructor, and that pilot just passed away here, uh, mm -hmm. his son, has the gun, uh, has the military show uh, out at the armory there. Huh. Uh, Bernard? Doug, uh, Doug. Uh, Bernard. Bernard. Yeah, so His Doug. father was my instructor really? <laughs> in SA 16s. <laughs> Thank you for remembering. It's okay. No, I know Bernard. Yeah, the old uh, Jim Bernard. He, Made the landing, he said, God, Heil, we're not flying a submarine. <laughs> the water came up all over the airplane. <laughs> he, he, he said, you got the whole ocean to land in. <laughs> so, yeah. pulling back, um, after Korea, you got on board to be a military instructor. And how, so... Yeah, Start us came, there. What did you start my, doing? My wife joined me in Japan for a year. Where? Uh, in uh, Kyushu, hmm. Fukuoka City. I flew out of Brady Field. Now, Brady Field is an American sure. general's name, and I can't think of the Japanese name, but uh, the city, Fukuoka is a city. It's oh, a wow. southern island. I was there for uh, a year. My wife showed up. Uh, they came, she came over at government expense, bring my car over government expense. Mm. Uh, I had one, probably one of the best jobs at that time because I was a flight instructor. I kind of flew when I wanted to. Uh, I was also an uh, uh, instructor with the bootstrap program through the University of Maryland. What is college that? Professor. If you wanted to take uh, college courses, uh, they had some people with degrees in education. Uh, you could teach night classes for college credit 
to military personnel. Oh. So I taught American history. I taught uh, uh, English composition. Wow. And they could get uh, through the University of Maryland. I was designated as a, not a full professor. They've got another name for it. I can't think of the name. Adjunct? Yeah, yeah. Adjunct, Adjunct professor? Adjunct professor, yeah. So you're overseas, and yeah. other guys who are overseas with you yes. who want to get credit from yes, an American university. Credit. Yeah, the bootstrap program was big known at that time. Wow. So I was racking up a uh, year's experience as a teacher for civilian life. That is cool. Yeah. That is really cool. Yeah. Now, the university didn't pay anything. Yeah. You were on duty, and, and uh, yeah. I had about 20 people in my classes, and I taught uh, Tuesdays and Thursday evenings mm -hmm. uh, for an hour and a half. And I was also the uh, safety officer. So you're still giving the lectures every Friday. Uh, every Don't Friday take off night. early. Yeah. <laughs> well, from, <laughs> from 4 to 4.30, I gave uh, safety. And uh, I also uh, was appointed assistant accident investigating officer. What is that? What's uh, that tell? I followed the real uh, accident investigating officer around with a clipboard. If we had an accident or incident, you know. I did that, but that was just an added on duty. Flying safety officer, though, I was number one there for that mm. job. And uh, I was, like I said, an instrument instructor, flight instructor. Mm. And uh, I tried to pile up, uh, accrue these jobs so that I could stay in if I wanted to. I sure. would stay in very badly. And uh, so then uh, my wife's father had... Uh, uh, cancer and so she a terminal mm. so she said I'll go home and uh, take care of things for my father yeah. and my mother and she says in six months I'll come back because I could stay another year and I said nope I said we'll both go home I said I don't want you to go home by yourself sure. without your father I can't do that so I came home and uh, immediately signed up with the reserve uh, flying uh, here in Portland and what year was this? Uh, that would have been uh, the 50s, late 50s. 50. Mm. Well, let's see, Korea was 51, 52, 53, so that had been 54. Okay. Yeah, late 53 probably, early 54. So right after Korea, you yeah, yeah. came to the States. Came back home. Then uh, finally, uh, I got. Pr I was flying then Air Sea Rescue with Jim Bernard. <laughs> you know, uh, I got. I I knew they had an opening. Yeah. And uh, troop carriers were a thing of the past, kind of. I mean, things had calmed down considerably. Yeah. Uh, so I applied for uh, that job, and they had an opening, but they didn't have a job. I was now a uh, major. Really. And uh, so the next thing that happened was. Uh, uh, a very good friend of mine, he also transferred over and uh, that I was in Korea with. He's dead now. Mm. Larry Folker was his name, and he got into the Air Sea Rescue Squadron, Jim Bernard. Jim. Wow. So Jim Bernard is a lieutenant colonel. I'm a major. Larry is a major. So Jim Bernard called both of two majors in and said, Gentlemen, he says, uh, uh, you uh, both are up for promotion. And he says, there's no reason not, he says, I can't find anything wrong. He says, you look good. But he says, there's only room for one lieutenant colonel yeah. in this squadron. And he says, you two guys are going to be three lieutenant colonels, you're counting me. And he says, you're going to retire. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not ready to retire. And he says, you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry's retired too. So. I see. So so anyway, I had been doing survival training for the Army Guard as a loner. I, they'd go over and once every six months, and I'd give them an hour or two lecture on all their survival equipment. How did you the, get into that in the first place? What? How did you start um, learning about survival? Oh. And how did you uh, become our, that go, journey? Go back to World War II. Okay. I flew two missions, I think, to Alaska. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I was amazed at, you know, if you force landing, land, you know, you're on your own, kind of. So, uh, you know, carry a first aid kit with you in your pocket or whatever. So were you, was this like personal? You're thinking, if I go down, what am I going to do? Yeah. They, now, they had survival kits, but I mean, they weren't spending much time on survival at that time. Uh, so, I, well, how I got, I was in between the two trips to Alaska. I went on leave, 
and came back to the squadron and they said, congratulations. I said, I just got promoted last month or whatever it was. <laughs> they said, you're now the survival training officer. Okay. I said, what am I supposed to do? Well, give lectures on survival. Well, there was a book put out by the Craigheads, John and Frank Craighead, twins, that had written the book that had become the Navy Survival Bible. I have an original copy signed by them. Very cool. I talked to them, Frank and John. Really? I like Frank. He had a good name. He was the oldest one, too. But it, how I, uh, when I came back, I was appointed survival officer, and they said, you're going off to survival school, hmm. which I did. So I went to the... Uh, school instead, uh, Air Force Base, that was the global survival school. Then I went hmm. to the tropical jungle, I went to the desert uh, school, I went to the uh, overwater school, I went to five different survival schools, just one right after the other. And how long did it take for you to go through all of them? Uh, about a year, actually. So for a year, so let me all make sure I'm, I'm following here. So. Yeah. You flew two missions in Alaska yep. during the Second World War? To Alaska. To, great to Alaska. Montana, yeah. Okay, so Montana to Alaska. Yeah. And then um, you got back to your squadron? Yeah. And they kind of gave you... I got out then for a period of time. I see. finished school, college. I see. So who ordered you to the this year of survival training? Well, I went on leave and came back and the squadron commander, since nobody wanted the job, <laughs> no... I was absent. I had no choice. That's when they said, congratulations. I said, for what? And they said, you're the new survival training So they officer. volunteered you while you were gone. Uh, yes. I see. So then... And I, now, nobody wanted it. I felt, what an opportunity. Yeah. I'll rack up another job, another, uh, they call them MOS, Military Occupational Specialty Scores, I think, mm -hmm. something like that, MOS. Military. Yeah, it sounds about right, yeah. Military o Occupation yeah. Specialist or something so like that. So I thought, hey, I, I want it. And uh, so, heck, I didn't mind going to school. I'd gone to school all my life anyway. I mean, what the heck, I was a professional student. So when was this? Was this in the late 40s or the 50s when you are going through all these schools? I was home from Korea, so okay. Right so it was after, after Korea. Korea, yeah, right after. So this Korea. is actually worked out really well because yeah. you you just kind of unexpectedly had to come back to the states, yeah. and now you've you know the path of life, so yeah. to speak, has yeah. brought you yeah. some really interesting places. Yeah, would you mind kind of going into? If not, you know, we don't have to go through every school, but which one was your favorite? And what do you remember oh, most about it? Oh, the Arctic School by far. Oh, the Arctic School. Yeah. Where was, was that? It was with a real Eskimo. <laughs> oh, okay. Ikaksak. <laughs> oh, that was the instructor. name? instructor, yeah. Whoa. Where Where was this? Uh, Resolute and the Comox, British Columbia. Okay. Uh, the school was actually, the classes were, what's the uh, big Canadian in Alberta, the name of the town? Uh, starts with a C. Um, I can't went, remember. Calgary? Calgary. Calgary. I went to uh, Arctic school. I went wow. to Canadian survival school there as an exchange student. Sure. And then after I completed their cold weather school, I went to Comox, uh, British Columbia, to their overwater school. Then I went to uh, Alaska to the Arctic school. But while I was at the uh, Canadian school, I went out to a place called Resolute, which was the highest northern land in the North American continent or something like that. I mean, it's mm -hmm, on the map. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, this was the last class, as I recall, where they had any dogs involved with a, go out on the ice pack with dogs. And uh, they were changing over to snowmobiles. Mm. And... Uh, of course, they'd always have some dogs because the Eskimos love dogs. But the Eskimo instructor we had, all I remember here now is his name is Ikaksak. But uh, and we had a uh, Canadian a sergeant, uh, Royal Air Force at that time, and an Eskimo. Two of them were your instructors, and we went out and lived and made snow houses. Wow! And lived in those. I said uh, to Ikaksak, I said, boy. You're going to get snowmobiles. You won't have to feed those dogs every night and harness them and fuss around with dogs all the time. They had a, they'd, uh, what they'd do at the end of the day, 
they'd get out these char, Arctic char, which is a salmon, and they'd chop off the heads and put the heads in the soup pot, feed the fish to the dogs. I said to the I said, wait a minute, <laughs> he switches. <laughs> he said, the best part of the fish is in the head, the fat is in the head. He said, you want the head, head for soup, hmm. head soup. And, I, and then, so then later on I said to him, now, Ikaksak, you won't have to do all this chopping of these fish. You know, harness, the dogs are difficult to harness. I mean, you know, they're barking and yapping around. And he said, uh, no, he said, I like the dogs. He says, the dogs, he says, you can't eat a snowmobile. And I, said, I see. That bothered me a little bit. The old dogs. And if you get out on the ice pack and can't get back, the leads open up and you can't get home. You have to eat the oldest dog. Yeah. I said, oh, okay. I never did eat a dog. I ate dog in Korea, but not, not really? in Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> How is dog? I uh, didn't know I was eating dog. I had a, uh, an instructor. You know, you're always assigned as a co-pilot mm -hmm. uh, to a new unit. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had a, my pilot was named Jack, Jack O'Neill. And uh, I was his co-pilot for, a, he had to make a, a landing in every field of operation, a night landing and a day landing. And the pilot had to check you out as a first pilot. So uh, as kind of a celebration, the pilot always took you out downtown. Uh, I think we were in Pusan at that time, taking me to dinner. You know, the celebration you graduated. Now, some guys never made his co-pilot or got out of the job, never got out of the seat. <laughs> You're just there. And uh, <laughs> so he takes me to dinner, and he says, I'll order for you. He, goes, he could speak Korean quite well. You know, he'd been there for two or three years, and okay. I'd just been there like months. And uh, I could say good morning and goodbye, and that was about it. And uh, so he uh, ordered for me, and I ate it, and I thought I was eating pork in a way. It had a different so after we'd eaten it, it was the specialty of the house was a dog. And uh, I said, yeah, that's all right. I'd, I'd eat it. And then I talked to my dog at home. <laughs> when did he tell you it was dog that he No, ordered? he didn't tell me until after I'd eaten it, of okay. course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I ordered it a couple of times while I was there. When I checked out my co-pilot, he got dog meat to eat. That was kind of... <laughs> this was kind of like a thing. Yeah, you, know, you did that. <laughs> <laughs> So you get back... Um, you're taking all these survival trainings. This is after Korea. Yeah, I went to Panama, took it there. Uh, went to the desert, which was in Arizona, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Arizona. Uh, the trop yeah, tropics. And then to the... they At that time, uh, they, were, uh, they were big on... Uh, NATO was just coming into the picture, yep. I think. And they were all for exchange students. Now, we had a French student, Jan Schutte. I talked to him. He's a Frenchman. He came here and we went through our class. I went to France. I went through the class in France. Oh, French really? At France. I went through the. And what, what class was this? Uh, it was a water survival. Wait, so, like open water? Yeah. Like if you land and live in the sea, you know, life uh, rafts and uh, how to uh, use the uh, uh, salt water still to make fresh water mm -hmm. and uh, uh, how to learn to swim and float and all that sort of good stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Jan Schutte, great guy. He was a major in the uh, French so Air they, Force. So the, the, the Air I, Force. I talked to him last week. He talked to me too. Really? Yeah. And where is he at? Uh, he lives in Pornichet, France now. He's okay. retired and a wine merchant. Cool. He, oh, he brings me... Uh, he, he did not come during the, uh, the, what do we call it, COVID. He was supposed to come last March and stay here with me, and he yeah. always bring me a big bottle of wine, and I still got some of the empty bottles here <laughs> with a French label on So the Air Force is sending you all over the world. Yeah. And um, so what happens next for you after you've gone through all these trainings? I just became a survival instructor for the military, the whole mill, like the uh, yeah, Air Force, Army, Reserve mostly. Okay. Now we had a mobile team. Mm -hmm. uh, your Air Force schools are fixed now. Like you've heard about the one at Stead Air Force Base, mm -mm. big survival school there. Uh, 
And this is in Washington? Yeah. Spokane. Okay, okay, okay. Spokane, okay. Washington. And I assume guys from Joint Base, McCord, Lewis McCord. Yeah, yeah. Go to that school quite a bit. Uh, I don't know where they've got a survival school. I think they have a squadron level. Oh, okay. This I was see. Air Force level uh, okay. at uh, uh, Spokane, Fairchild Air Force Base. I see, I yeah. see. Uh, and I still talk to their instructors that are retired and they're still. That is cool. But now, uh, when I got to be 60, I must have been 62. Not very many people on flying status in the military at 62. Uh, usually by 50, you're finished. Mm -hmm. uh, I flunked the physical. Army. I was in the Army now, flying helicopters. What kind of helicopter? Uh, Hueys. And uh, the flight surgeon was a personal friend. I'd flown with him. Quite a bit. He'd flown with us in rescue missions. Mm -hmm. uh, John Curry, Dr. Don, John Curry. I took my physical and he says, Frank, it's time to retire. I said, Yeah, I'm not going to retire yet. He says, Yes, you are. And I said, What, what happened? What was uh, it that got you? Got glasses. Oh, really? Yeah. He says, You can't pass the physical. Mm -hmm. And hearing, he says, You can't pass that. I said, what about the grandfather clause? I'd heard about this, you know, sneak you through. And he says, you've been on it for two years. Ah. I said, we can't do this anymore. It, now, that's strictly verboten. I mean, you don't do it. Yeah. But, you know, I, I could pass it early on a Monday morning or uh, before 10 o'clock. But I, the afternoon, I'd flunk it. <laughs> and uh, so he said, no, time to go home. So... They started my uh, retirement, and that's when I went to my boss, Colonel Antros was his name. at the six, I was now assigned to the 6th Army. What year was this? 83. So and so we kind of skipped over Vietnam. What were you doing during the Vietnam here. War? Well, in the States. I never okay. went, left the States. Flew okay. freight mm -hmm. for the, with the Air Force. Okay. Yeah. Uh, passengers. Uh, yeah. So in 82 or 83, they 83. told you? 83. They said yeah. it's time See, to retire. See, I went in, 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 in uh, 1943, early, early and uh, got out in 83. That's 40 years, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Got my paperwork wow. hanging on the wall there, inside the hall there. Uh, uh, framed. My daughter framed it. Cool. Uh, but uh, now, uh, John Curry said go home, so I went to uh, Colonel Antros and I said, I flunked the physical. And he says, well, your days are numbered. <laughs> and, and he says, good, he said, you can retire now. And I said, hey, but I want to stay in, you know, jokingly. And he said, well, he says, we, well, there's a way. Now, I was primarily being held in, not because of my flying. You got pilots still all over the place. Is a survival instructor. I was the what they known as the principal instructor or the commandant of the mobile training team. Principal instructor for the mobile training team that traveled to the reserve components with the Air Force and the basically the Army Guard because they cannot get off to their jobs to go to these schools, you know. Are you familiar with how the guard works? I mean, you take your two weeks training. I know that it's kind of, is it, I don't know much. I know that okay. it's part-time. Yeah, you fly one weekend a month, mm -hmm. and you go two weekends, or two full weeks training, but you learn uh, operational combat. You don't have time to go to a survival school. Well, you begin to get a lot of uh, troops that uh, land and live in the desert, land and live in the water, uh, and uh, so they said, hey, what we want to do is set up a mobile. I was doing that while on active duty and in the guard. Was We went to five, this John Lane I just showed you a picture of. He was our number one instructor in the water school and also the, the uh, uh, mountaineering, all of it. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he great guy. You ought to meet him sometime. But anyway, uh, Colonel Antros says, go home, put on your civilian clothes, and come back one month from today as a civilian contractor. And uh, I said, well, what's going to be good about that? And he said, well, you earn a little more money. <laughs> and he says, uh, you get to change your name from 
lieutenant colonel to mister on the door, same office, same, everything's the same. I said, okay. So now I did it as a civilian for 14 years after that, after I left in 80, 1983. So you were working as an instructor. and I mean, what kind of guys would you be instructing? What kind of guys? Uh, I wore just reserve, clothes, reserve guys? Or I could wear my... I wore civilian. These were all crews, air crews. Okay. Uh, and I'd go to their weekend training mm-hmm. drills. We went to Texas. We went to uh, Hawaii. We went to Puerto Rico. We went to uh, in about eight or ten states. Uh, we'd go in and just give them uh, one whole day of nothing but survival training. Was this all classroom, or was there some practical? Uh, practical. We went to the field two uh, during the two week active duty. We'd take them to the field. Wow. Yeah. What kind of stuff would you have them do? Yeah. yeah that was more fun than being on active duty. I mean, actually, I mean. What kind of stuff would you have them do when they were out in the field? Uh, well, they'd start right out by uh, they'd have their survival kits and equipment, and they'd teach them how to use it how to build a fire with a flint and steel. And we had a procedure that uh, five things that uh, called the, the uh, menu for survival or survival practices. Uh, first thing you have to do is get a shelter. Number one, a shelter, build a shelter. While it's still daylight, you hope. Even an animal will look for shelter. I mean, the shelter is number one. Uh, number two, you'd let uh, heat from an external source. Uh, number three, I'd uh, start, to, uh, God, I've even forgotten now. I taught it for years. But uh, let's see, shelter, heat from an external source. No, let's start with number one, first aid. If you're injured, take care of any injury oh, okay. you might have. Okay. That's number one. Then uh, shelter, then heat from an external source, then signaling, and then uh, survival, you know, how to set up your camp and food, food and water. That was number, those were the five, wow. remember those. Okay. They're in the book. Uh, the Arctic Field Manual? Yeah. I or this guy right here. I think they're in both books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, first aid, shelter, heat from an external source, food, water. That food and water was last. Signaling, signaling, signaling. Oh, okay. For rescue. Yeah. Oh, okay. Get that in there. I think signaling for rescue is number three. <laughs> it's all right. There's the you know, book. I, I, I uh, like this uh, guy that uh, in the picture here. I couldn't remember his name. Uh, you know the problem in about 50, 60 years. Things start to get difficult to remember. Yeah, I couldn't even remember my uh, cousin's name the other day. He called me. I can remember his last name, but I couldn't remember his call. Call by his last name. Just call by his last name. Just, 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 just get away with calling. Hey, you. <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, all right. All of this is in here, too, I think, in those cool. newspaper articles, probably. So just to kind of wrap up, um, how long were you a civilian instructor? Well, 14 years after I was... I, I was a. Uh, in fact, I just taught my last class about a year ago. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and how old are you now, sir? Ninety-eight. Wow. Well, so are you now officially retired? Yeah, but I'd go teach another class with help if John Lane were with me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really appreciate it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cap it off here. Well, this is. Andrew with the Modern Military History Podcast, and we are with Mr. Frank Heil. Frank, thank you so much. You're quite, quite welcome. I've enjoyed it.